Hi, everyone. Welcome to, the, to today's CRR event. We appreciate everyone joining us for our discussion and we look forward to our presentation. I'm Matt Pietrasi with Climate Advisors, which is part of the CRR Consortium, along with Aid Environment, Aid Environment and Profundo. CRR provides sustainability risk analysis for investors in soft commodities, and you can find our reports and events on our website. Our focus today will be on the beef market in Brazil and the various risks that companies operating there face. In recent years, beef production in Brazil has expanded considerably amid favorable market conditions. These trends have occurred at the same time that deforestation, fires, and land grabbing in the Amazon, in the Amazon have all increased sharply. Investors and buyers in global supply chains have, meanwhile, started demanding compliance with sustainable practices and transparency from the cattle sector, particularly the three big companies, JBS, Marfrig, and Minerva. The ongoing exposure to supply chain deforestation together with the impacts of COVID-19 may result in fundamental business risk for these companies. That is what we'll discuss today. A few housekeeping issues before we move forward. Everyone in the audience is on mute, but if you have any questions, you can type you can type them into the Q&A function and we'll aim to answer them after our presentation. We'll put an archive recording of the event on our website in the coming days. And once it is on our site, we'll, we will alert every, all of our readers. And now um, I'd like to hand it over to Barbara Cooper of Profundo and Tim Steinweg of Aid Environment for the main presentation. Good morning and good afternoon. Um, I'm going to start with a brief overview of the beef market in Brazil, its role in deforestation and which factors contribute to this situation before handing over then to Tim for a case study on uh, JBS. Uh, the Brazilian beef market has continued to expand in, uh, over the years and comprises now a very important part of the economy. The production has increased by more than 50% in 20 years. Um, as part of the economy, it now accounts for roughly 8.5% of the GDP. In that domestic consumption dominates with uh, around 76% in uh, 2019. As you can see from the graphic on the left, the production increase has uh, gone along with an increase in exports. The domestic consumption remains the largest part of the market, but the export volume and share have been growing. That's among others uh, due to strong demand from China, which has been uh, further pushed by the outbreak of the African swine fever, which uh, decimated the pork production in uh, China quite uh, significantly and has increased beef and meat exports as a consequence. At the same time, the US has started to open up uh, unprocessed beef, beef imports again, which had been banned due to concerns over corruption and its impacts on food safety for several years. So. It's expected that from February this year onwards, there will also be an increasing market in the US again for these imports. What remains obviously in the current situation unclear is what the impact of COVID-19 will be. And we're coming back to that later again. It's, uh, Brazil is the largest exporter in the world of beef already since 2017. And um, there are a couple of large players which are very important on the domestic as well as the export market, which are JBS, Mafric, and Minerva, as already mentioned by Matt. Um, they have all, um, yeah, the, the, the cattle herd has expanded, as I mentioned before, and it has also expanded in the Amazon. Um, the, the graphic, uh, on the slide shows uh, deforestation rates in the Amazon for the periods from August 1 through April 30 for the last 12 years roughly uh, it is and you can see there quite a big jump in deforestation. Um, the, with the expansion of the cattle herd that has 
had especially an impact in uh, in the legal Amazon, where um, several slaughterhouses are also located. Um, we have um, more, around 100 slaughterhouses in Amazon states that have a license to trade across state borders, which means that they can supply the, the bigger domestic market and often also export markets. Um, and many of those are also in the hands of uh, a rather small number of large players. The, the role of beef in, uh, uh, of cattle ranching in Amazon deforestation is estimated at around 80% of the, the deforestation in, in the Amazon as a whole, um, which has different motivations. It's, it can be um, for actual um, cattle ranching purposes, but in some instances, uh, the economic drivers can also be different. It can be the underlying land, which can be used then for other commodity production. And, and rearing, rearing cattle on that land is a cheap way to prevent the forest from growing back, which can also be a driver for deforestation. Uh, at the same time, it's also quite obvious that um, the, the fires that have been observed on at much higher rates than in the past in the last couple of years, that they are often or more frequently found in beef production zones. If you move to the next slide, please. These graphics uh, from, from the B Beef Production Association in Brazil and Trace show quite clearly the overlap between the concentration of the cattle herd in the in the center north regions and at the same time the the cattle driven deforestation risk which very much overlaps with these areas in the Amazon and also in uh, parts of the Cerrado which is uh, a wooded savanna which is also uh, very much affected by land conversion and at the same time a very important and biodiverse region in Brazil. Next slide, please. So the political context obviously has also changed uh, in the last one and a half years. And the, the pro-business and anti-regulation agenda of the current government has further contributed to, to um, undermining enforcement and weakening legislation in um, in relation to environmental and social protect protection for the Amazon and its inhabitants. Um, there are major concerns, for example, over the funding of the environmental authority IBAMA, which is also reflected in a quite rapid drop in um, environmental fines. Those fines are mm. rarely paid anyways, but mm. um, they are among others, also an important tool for enforcing laws or, for example, in uh, blocking access to rural credit for, for um, in that case, ranchers who, who act illegally. Um, there have also been attempts to fast track uh, regular, regularization of seized lands, which has uh, actually led to, to international protests, among others, from, from international retailers, from civil society organizations and from investors who, um, together with also the Federal Public Prosecutor's Office, um, protested against the consequences that could have if uh, illegal squatting of, uh, of public rural lands becomes uh, legalized. Next slide, please. So if we look a bit more at um, what drives the, the unsustainability in the beef sector, um, it's good to have a, have a look at um, the structure of the supply chain, which is attempted in this graphic. Uh, on the right side, you see um, the slaughterhouses in the center, slaughterhouses or meat packers who get supplied from direct suppliers, which is the final farm or feedlot where cattle is fattened. Their monitoring of the supply chain is largely implemented 
is, well, if we're looking at the top, top meat packers. Um, but then there is a large part of the supply chain that is still in transparent and outside of the monitoring system where cattle laundering may occur because on average purchases to direct farms come from 15 indirect suppliers, which may source again from previous rearing farms and various farms before that between birth and slaughter of cattle which means that transparency and visibility is, is very much limited. Um, there is by now a relatively high compliance in direct supply chains. If you look at the top three meat packers uh, in the Amazon, I have to say there, it looks different in the Cerrado biome where this is um, much less implemented. But then if you look at the indirect supply chain that still remains largely out of sight. The next slide, please. There are a couple of factors that can be identified which undermine the performance of sustainability agreements, which have been agreed on already in 2009. Uh, the large meat packers agreed at the time to, to increase sustainability in their sourcing in the Amazon. Um, but there is 10 years after that, due to a lack of political will, limited accountability and inadequate monitoring, especially of the indirect supply chain, still a lacking performance of these agreements. Some of the key factors are listed here. I'm not going to go into all that much detail, just very briefly. As I said before, the monitoring focuses on the tier one suppliers, which means that a large share of the overall supply chain remains out of sight. Um, the, there is uh, the Rural Environmental Registry, which can be used as a, ideally as a tool to support monitoring and enforcement. Unfortunately, the fact that it's self-declaration of properties and there is no independent verification of the accuracy of these declarations means that there is, um, there are possibilities to commit fraud in these registrations that can help to launder cattle. Mm, yeah, and yeah, moving cattle between different properties. Um, and uh, cattle laundering also refers then more broadly to the fact that um, this, the systems aren't um, allowing easily to follow the the movement of cattle between different ranches and with that it's possible to have cattle from deforested areas to be moved to properties that are fulfilling the, the, the regulatory um, requirements and then reach a slaughterhouse. The, the registrations in the environmental registry and the animal transport documentation which in a in combination could help to strengthen um, monitoring and compliance are not um, easily accessible, uh, which makes it much more difficult to use them. Um, again, not helping in tracking the indirect supply chain then. Um, there are currently various um, explorations of how to analyze property and animal transportation data for the purpose of supply chain monitoring and we will hear a bit more about that in a moment. Another factor is that uh, no sanctions are applied for breaches of the sustainability agreements uh, despite many cases being uncovered where the audits show that uh, irregularities have happened. Uh, not all slaughterhouses are part of these agreements. Not all of them have signed them. There are estimates that around 30% uh, of the slaughter capacity in the Amazon have not signed such an agreement and are completely out of sight then. Um, and lastly, the lack of regularized regulation and monitoring in the Cerrado biome means that their land conversion uh, can um, um, happen outside of any of these um, agreements. Next slide, please. There have been frequent cases of laundering documented in the supply chains of the three big um, 
meatpackers, also other companies are affected, but um, these examples named here are focusing on JBS, Smurfrig and Minerva. I'm not going to mention them all. These are just cases that have been published in 2020. Um, there's um, the, the, the Gibbs, um, sorry, the Gibbs Land Use and Environmental Environment Lab um, found farms selling cattle to EU export approved slaughterhouses being linked to 13,000 hectares of deforestation. Uh, Greenpeace uh, showed that cattle grazing on deforested land in a national park in uh, Mato Grosso sold to the big three. Reporter Brazil documented several cases in the Cerrado as well as in the Amazon. And also Amnesty International published a report on uh, cattle from illegal ranches in reserves in Rondonia entering JBS supply chain. And we're in a moment going to hear about our own research on deforestation in the JBS supply chain. So there's a range of operational, legal and reputational risks. And again, uh, they will be made uh, a bit more concrete in a moment. At the case, uh, with the case that we're going to present. There are policy and legal risks as uh, due diligence laws and disclosure requirements are introduced or under consideration in several countries. Examples are, for example, the, the law in uh, France um, that also can affect, for example, retailers in Brazil. Uh, two of the two largest retailers are owned by French parents. Um, so that can also Improve, increased risk exposure of these retailers by having to fulfill due diligence laws and, um, and um, with new investigations showing, for example, that uh, GPA, which is a subsidiary of Casino, is also exposed to Amazon deforestation that yeah, could, could create new risks for companies. Uh, as well, the EU-Mercosur agreement is still under negotiations and there is certainly a threat that due to concerns over deforestation and forest fires in the Amazon, that this is not going to be agreed anytime soon, uh, looking at the, 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 um, the issues raised by several European countries or, or authorities. Um, also, um, the the market access and financial risks grow as investors and buyers demand action. There are various examples by now of um, companies and financial institutions uh, voicing their concerns about uh, the um, environmental impacts um, in uh, the Amazon and partially also in the Cerrado. Um, there's been uh, statements by financial institutions which manage more than 3.7 trillion US dollars in assets which expressed their concern about uh, the lack of a stable and predictable regulatory environments, but also so, um, threatening with eventually, possibly, um, removing investments. Uh, there is an example already from July 2020 that Nodia Asset Man Management excluded JBS shares from its uh, funds, pointing to the uh, environmental record and uh, the response to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and unsatisfactory outcome of uh, engagement. There are financial risks from uh, various sides that uh, shareholders, bondholders and bank banks could face due to increasing risk from violations in the meat supply chain, which could affect the value of investments and uh, also through stranded assets. And um, there is certainly a large risk of uh, reputation damage from being linked to deforestation uh, in the Amazon and um, the supply chain uh, still remaining highly exposed to that. With that, I would like to hand over to Tim to present the case study of JPS that Chain Rachel Research has published. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Barbara, also for your presentation and Matt for hosting the webinar. Welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, maybe good night for, uh, for some of you. Uh, 
Um, so I'll be speaking about the uh, publication that we released about two weeks ago in which we look specifically at the company JBS, uh, very much within the context of the broader piece that Barbara has just presented. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about JBS, about their uh, deforestation exposure, their deforestation footprint, as well as the materiality of the business risks um, that may be associated with that. Um, but first, to start off with a, a short introduction uh, into the company. So JBS, I suspect that most listeners will have heard of this company before, is the largest meat packer uh, and meat processor in the world. It's active in the beef supply chain, but also has pork and poultry and other related uh, businesses. Um, it operates out of five different business divisions, two of which are in Brazil. So that is JBS Brazil and uh, Seara. Uh, and it has three international divisions, JBS Beef USA, JBS Pork USA, and Pilgrim's Pride. Um, those latter three international divisions uh, make up more than 80% of the company's revenues. So while it's headquarters in Brazil, most of its revenues are generated abroad. Um, in addition to this 80% of revenues from those divisions, it's important to note that even the Brazilian divisions uh, are increasingly reliant on export markets. So the most recent quarterly figures released uh, uh, not long ago uh, illustrate that more than half of the revenues of both its, uh, uh, its beef and its pork and chicken businesses now come from export markets. Uh, China being by far the most important of that export market, uh, accounting for more than a third of the company's exports in the second quarter of this year. And as Barbara has mentioned, a, uh, uh, one explanation is indeed uh, related to the outbreak of the African swine fever and the decimation of the uh, domestic uh, pig population in China. And therefore, it's growing uh, dependent on imported meat. Um, JBS has uh, long standing plans to issue a stock listing in the US. Uh, uh, this was first discussed, I think, in 2015, 2016, uh, has been postponed several times. Um, uh, messages resurfaced back at the, at the end of last year, um, and the details that have come out in terms of the plans for this listing uh, suggest that it would constitute a spin-off of the uh, three international business divisions from the Brazilian government, from the Brazilian company, uh, and would create two separate companies, one with a listing in New York, one in Sao Paulo, uh, initially with the same shareholders. Next slide, please. So JBS has also uh, for quite a long time now uh, been associated with uh, deforestation impacts in its supply chain. Um, this is primarily because it is the largest uh, meat processor and uh, meat packer in the legal Amazon. Uh, it has the highest daily production capacity uh, through its operations in 20 slaughterhouses within the legal Amazon. Uh, earlier studies that have mapped out the potential buying zones for each of those slaughterhouses also indicate that uh, JBS is ranked first in terms of its uh, potential deforestation exposure. Um, JBS has committed to zero deforestation. Uh, it has a uh, monitoring system through which it implements that commitment um, for its direct supply chain in the Amazon. Um, so it monitors daily approximately 50,000 direct suppliers. However, its monitoring system does not extend into both the Sahado biome as well as uh, possibly more important, um, it does not yet have systems in place to systematically monitor uh, its second and beyond indirect tiers of its supply chain. Um, partially because of that and, and because it's the biggest company, uh, we have seen long-standing and persistent coverage of the company's controversial practices by NGOs and uh, media outlets. Uh, 
uh, and we have noticed a, a pickup of the frequency of this coverage in recent months. Next slide, please. So what we have done for this publication is we have tried to map out as much of the company's supply chain as we possibly could. Uh, we did that by looking at a uh, 2019 data set of animal transportation data, as well as rural cadaster data uh, for uh, six states um, in Brazil. Um, and what we've been able to do is uh, create a sample of uh, JBS's supply chain uh, of a little less than 3,000 of its uh, suppliers that we have been able to locate uh, and have the polygons of that we know exactly where the boundaries of the farms are that are registered um, and for which we have evidence to be in JBS's supply chain. Uh, these include uh, 983 direct suppliers uh, in the small image on the left they are depicted with the uh, with the yellow spots and 1874 indirect supply uh, suppliers uh, which can be seen in blue uh, this is across uh, six brazilian states um, our estimation based on um, the uh, number of uh, uh, suppliers that we know exist or that we have data on, uh, our, our sample covers approximately 10% of the company's supply chain, direct supply chain in these states. For the indirect supply chain, that figure is a lot lower and we estimate that between 1% and 2% of its indirect supply chain we've been able to look at. Uh, what this data set allows us to do, both for this publication as well as for future work, is we can more granularly uh, analyze past deforestation. So that's one of the things that we'll be talking about today is we've looked at uh, uh, the historical deforestation rates on these properties since 2008. Um, it also allows us to conduct more near real-time monitoring of, uh, of land use change uh, on these properties as well as uh, make assessments of future risks. Um, so on the basis of this data set, we detected since 2008 a uh, little over 20,000 hectares of deforestation in its direct supply chain. The majority of that was uh, found within the Sahado biome, uh, for which we know um, the monitoring systems uh, do not necessarily uh, uh, cover uh, land use change in that biome. Um, we calculated an average for all of the farms, both the farms that had deforestation as well as those that did not have deforestation. And we came to a figure of an average of about 20 hectares per property. Uh, for the indirect supply chain, those figures are significantly higher. So we found more than 50,000 hectares of deforestation since 2008 in its indirect supply chain. Uh, and then if you calculate the averages there, we see that there's a, a, a we come up with a number of 27 hectares uh, per property on average. So next slide, please. So on the basis of these findings, what we've done is we tried to make an estimate uh, of uh, what that means for the entire uh, supply chain of these companies. And so we very conservatively uh, tried to calculate what this means for its direct supply chain uh, based on these averages and, and the number of uh, uh, properties that we had identified. Um, we project about 200,000 hectares of deforestation having taken place since 2008 in its direct supply chain. And for the indirect supply chain, that is uh, 1.5 million hectares of deforestation since 2008. Um, I think it's important to, uh, to note here that these are not specific numbers. Um, they are rough estimates. However, um, there's a number of arguments that we uh, bring forward to say that these are very conservative. Um, so we've looked only at uh, a total of six states. We've not included two states within the legal Amazon where JBS has a presence uh, in our projections. Um, 
we've only looked at the second tier supply chain for this study and have not looked or assessed uh, any exposure in the third tier or beyond. Uh, and then thirdly, what we've done in terms of calculating the deforestation, we uh, had a number of cases where the deforestation event actually spilled over beyond the boundaries of the farms that we identified. Um, and we've, uh, we've cut that off and only included uh, the hectares that are located within the boundaries uh, that we knew of. Um, so what do these numbers tell us? I think, uh, importantly, they tell us that um, the findings of some of the other uh, reports and publications that Barbara alluded to as well uh, are confirmed when we, when we look at a, a somewhat broader um, set of uh, farms. Uh, we see that there is an outsized footprint. We also see that that is uh, significantly higher in the indirect supply chain than it is in the direct supply chain, which is important because we know that uh, any risks in the indirect supply chain currently remain unmitigated. So we conclude that JBS has an outsized deforestation risk, um, which largely remains unmitigated. Uh, next slide, please. So what does that then mean in terms of the materiality of this risk exposure for JBS's business and for its uh, finances? Uh, that's the second part of the publication that we, uh, that we released. Um, and what we have done is, um, first of all, we look not just at the issue of deforestation. I think it's, uh, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to properly assess the impact of this risk in isolation in particular given the, uh, uh, the COVID-19 outbreak and how that has affected uh, the uh, meat industry as a whole and JBS in particular. So the risks that we just talked about now are compounded by the impacts of uh, COVID-19. So what we have done is we conducted a, a scenario analysis uh, in order to analyze four physical and transition risks that we identified that are related either to deforestation uh, and or to the pandemic. So the first one is uh, we looked at um, the more physical risk of uh, what, what are the impacts of the closures of meat plants, uh, mostly in response to the uh, COVID-19 outbreaks. Secondly, we looked at uh, how JBS may be affected by uh, current and future investor concern and shareholder action in particular related to deforestation. We looked at the impacts of uh, uh, market restrictions and supply chain exclusions for both COVID-19 and, and deforestation. Uh, and we looked at uh, changes in consumer preferences and the uh, emergence of uh, alternative protein substitutes. Um, We'll be discussing each one of these four in a little bit more detail, describing both the narrative as well as how we based our uh, projections uh, based on three different scenarios for each of those risk categories. So we looked at them in a, in a low impact scenario, in a medium impact scenario and a high impact scenario. Uh, next slide, please. So talking about the first risk of the uh, closures of uh, meat plants, I think the narrative is really around what we've seen happen um, after the outbreaks really uh, hit uh, mostly in the US and Brazil. Uh, by doing a, a local media scan, we identified a total of nine JBS facilities um, that were either uh, ordered to or voluntarily closed down after a COVID-19 outbreak. Um, what we've done is we try to estimate what that means in terms of downtime impact of these shutdowns. Uh, we're estimating that uh, the daily production capacity of the nine plants that we identified are in the range of about a thousand uh, cows, 18,000 pigs, and almost 700,000 chickens um, that faced uh, downtimes. Uh, obviously, that affects both sales as well as uh, biological and intangible assets. And we tried to project that by looking at uh, what happens to uh, the company's uh, income statement and balance sheet if these are all the downtime 
uh, events that the company faced in a, uh, in a low impact scenario, um, if there would be future intermittent downtime uh, of these plants for a period of six months in a medium impact scenario, or even permanent closure for 12 months in a high impact scenario. Um, our colleague uh, Gerard Rijk of Profundo is also on the line to answer any questions you might have on the financial impacts, which we see at the bottom of the slide. Uh, but very shortly, uh, I think what we're seeing is that you know rev revenue impact may range from uh, you know the, the the hundreds of millions of U.S. Uh, dollars up to um, almost eight billion. Uh, US dollars of impact in a, in a high impact or a stress test scenario. Uh, biological assets would be impacted as well as uh, goodwill of, uh, of plants and property. Uh, next slide, please. So the second risk that we looked at are the investor concern and shareholder action. Barbara talked about this uh, a little bit already. So we, we are seeing a, a trend where in particular the international investors are growing increasingly wary of uh, investing in Brazil uh, because of the political climate, economic conditions, but also uh, to a large part over uh, sustainability concerns like uh, deforestation. Um, as was mentioned, the, uh, uh, the public letter uh, signed by I believe 30 asset managers that quite overtly issued a warning of potential divestment from Brazil uh, is quite significant in this, uh, in this regard. Um, and it fits in a, both a recent string of investor action specifically towards JBS as well as a, a longer standing trend where we do see various uh, shareholders and other financial institutions uh, taking actions towards JBS. Um, so we talked about the, uh, the Nordia uh, divestment. There's other uh, exclusions and blacklistings of JBS already. Uh, we've seen uh, um, shareholders vote against uh, re-election of management. We've seen long-standing uh, in-depth engagement uh, processes. And so we see really a, quite a variety of, uh, of investor action towards specifically uh, the company of JBS. Um, now what that might mean in terms of future scenarios, it could, it could result in a higher cost of capital if there's a, a lower demand for its uh, publicly traded shares as well as uh, uh, difficulties in uh, refinancing loans. Um, th this could impact the company's cost of capital in the, in the longer term. So again, we looked at three scenarios. One uh, is where we looked at what would happen if the signatories of the public letter we talked about uh, would divest from JBS. What would happen if that's a low impact scenario, what would happen if both them as well as their parent companies would, would divest all of their funds uh, in a medium impact scenario? And what would happen if we see a broader base of primarily the, the European investors uh, pull out in a high impact scenario. Um, one thing to note, I won't go into detail on these figures, but one thing to note is that these are also quite conservative because we're just looking at the direct impact of such divestment uh, efforts and have not uh, included anything in terms of the signaling function that, that all these efforts also have and that may also more indirectly impact the uh, cost of capital of, uh, of this company. Next slide, please. Uh, so thirdly, we looked at uh, market restrictions and supply chain exclusion. So what happens uh, downstream to uh, JBS? Um, so I think that this both relates to uh, COVID-19 as well as deforestation. Uh, what we're seeing uh, increasingly happen is uh, important export markets uh, putting uh, customs restrictions on uh, imported meat, and I think this is particularly relevant for the, for the Chinese export market. Um, we have seen China impose restrictions for meat imports, in particular after uh, the outbreak in the Beijing food market that, that uh, may have been linked to uh, imported salmon. So we're seeing a number of uh, specific meat plants whose uh, import licenses have been revoked. Uh, we've seen blanket bans for specific Chinese provinces for uh, 
for frozen meat products being being uh, reported in media, and so we're we're very clearly seeing, you know, the the, the concern that through uh, imported meat uh, the virus may also uh, um, uh, pop up again in China, being being a big uh, uh, motivation for restrictions. And then in addition, what we've also seen is uh, that the deforestation exposure uh, has already and may result in, in future exclusions from specific corporate supply chains uh, because of non-compliance with uh, corporate uh, responsible sourcing policies. So uh, last year when we saw the, uh, the, uh, the fire crisis uh, um, in Brazil, um, we saw a number of retailers and supermarkets, as well as fashion brands who, uh, who purchase leather, um, restrict purchases of, uh, uh, of JBS and other Brazilian uh, meat companies. Um, and there's reason to believe that, that more may happen in the future. We, we, uh, as, as Barbara mentioned, we do see a, a growing uh, scrutiny of the role of, uh, of supermarkets uh, and there may be action coming from uh, from those actors as well. Um, JBS would be impacted by such trends uh, through reduced revenues, uh, through reduced earning margins, um, and we looked at that uh, from uh, either uh, the impacts of those exclusions that have already been reported on in a low impact scenario, um, we looked at it, what would happen if specific plants would be, would be blacklisted or specific corporate clients uh, would uh, uh, impose future restrictions in a medium impact scenario. And then finally, a stress test scenario where we looked at what would the, the uh, results of full restrictions to important export markets like China and, and the European Union. Uh, next slide, please. So finally, I think uh, a risk to flag is, uh, is the, the, the ongoing changes in consumer preferences. Um, I think in particular, when, when we look at Chinese consumer reports, uh, we see that both the African swine fever as well as COVID-19 um, have really um, increased the concerns around the safety and the sustainability of, uh, of meat products in particular, uh, the imported meat uh, products that uh, the JBS supplies to the Chinese markets. Uh, and we've seen uh, a number of reports come out that talk about the growing acceptance of animal or alpha plant-based protein alternatives uh, among Chinese consumers. And, and uh, that is happening uh, at the same time that um, these plant-based proteins are becoming a viable and economic substitute to animal proteins. We're seeing production cost uh, being reduced. We're seeing the, the difference in production cost in particular between plant-based and meat proteins uh, becoming more narrow. Uh, and some of the meat substitute companies are now uh, indicating they're ready to compete on price and are quite aggressively moving into uh, some of JBS's key export markets. Um, so what might happen to, to JBS is obviously they could lose revenues and they could lose market share to the plant-based alternatives that are uh, offered by some of its competitors. Uh, JBS has its own uh, uh, line of plant-based proteins as well, but obviously with the, um, with the momentum that companies like Beyond Foods and, uh, or Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods have, uh, there's no guarantee that, that it's able to capture a, a significant market share in this, uh, in this space. So we looked at the impacts of such a scenario. In a, in a low impact scenario, we were looking at uh, a reduction of uh, market share by 5%, 25% uh, in, in a medium impact scenario and up to 50% in a, in a high impact scenario. And again, the numbers presented here, um, I will let you uh, uh, read those yourself. So uh, final slide, please. So what we then did uh, is we looked at each of those uh, the risks individually and then uh, added uh, the impact up uh, to come to some sort of cumulative uh, uh, scenarios uh, for these four risk categories. 
Um, and what we're finding is a range of uh, impacts to the company's revenues. If we compare it to uh, 2019 revenues from a 1% impact in, in a low impact scenario, uh, up to almost a quarter of the revenues being, uh, being lost in a high impact scenario. Uh, when we talk about earnings, those, uh, those figures are higher and range from a 5% to a 26% uh, range. So in conclusion, I think what, what the, the argument of our paper is that these risks are compounded and that these risks are material uh, and that um, I think investors and analysts should not be blinded by the, the recent uh, um, positive financial results that, that the company has released, but that these are a number of risks that could play out in the longer term um, and, and need to be taken into account. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, conclude my presentation. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Tim. And thanks a lot, Barbara, for your presentations. Um, we have some questions in the queue um, and we'll get to them. We have some time for them now. So the first question up front, um, this is for Barbara. Um, could you elaborate more on how you define direct and indirect suppliers? Sure, yes. So. Uh, the, dis the differentiation between the two relies on the fact that the cattle supply chain is quite complex, as I mentioned. So it moves often between various locations between birth and slaughter. So that means also that that leads, depending on how many stages, to different levels of transparency. It's uh, being estimated that for every direct suppliers in the Amazon on average, 80% um, source cattle from other properties before selling it to a slaughterhouse. And that these transactions include purchases from 15 indirect suppliers. So that's before cattle reaches the last farm that then supplies a slaughterhouse. There's, it's, it's very difficult to, to put a figure on it, but uh, for example, Mafrig, uh, they um, stated that 53% of its cattle in the Amazon is sourced from indirect suppliers that may be higher for other companies. And um, it's also very clear from the monitoring reports of the, the meat packers that at this moment they do not yet monitor um, and have no traceability processes for these stages before the final direct supplier to their farms. It's maybe also good to mention that there are systems by now. There is, for example, um, there is VisiPack that has been developed by the University of Wisconsin, which is a computerized uh, tool that, um, that pools a lot of uh, government data to document the movement of cattle, and that is accessible to meat packers free of charge. It's just not picked up yet. Uh, thanks, Barbara. Uh, another question was about um, Visipac and the tracking solution. That's it's being it's under pilot now by Minerva and Marfrig um, as a way to uh, to be used for tracking and traceability issues in the indirect supply chain. Um, could you elaborate on your thoughts on that? Well, it's. Um... It's also not going to be a perfect tool, but it's going to significantly increase the possibilities. So um, it seems uh, that that would be an, an option to already make quite significant steps in, in increasing the monitoring of uh, the indirect supply chain. Uh, there's estimates that it has a potential to increase the coverage from 17 to 85 percent, which is certainly a uh, quite a leap in, uh, in improving the, the monitoring. There are other options as well, obviously, if you, if you look at cattle monitoring, how it's done in other countries, there are obviously tagging options, which would be a little bit more expensive. That's the reason, I guess, why it's not being chosen, but the, the technology exists and, and would certainly then um, uh, remove some of the problems that are being faced at the moment. <laughs> 
Great, thanks. Uh, next question is, are farms in the Sahado biome that fall into the legal Amazon being monitored by the meat packers? Tim, are you? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so uh, as we understand it, the, the monitoring systems of the meat packers currently rely on um, the uh, satellite monitoring by Brazil's uh, space agency. And they have two separate uh, um, systems of uh, deforestation alerts, one for the Amazon and one for the Sahara biome. Uh, as we understand it, the meat packers uh, use only the one for the Amazon biome and not the uh, Sahado biome. Um, in terms of uh, where the boundaries are of what they do and do not monitor, that, that's then fully a factor of, of the scope of those uh, systems. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Tim. Next question is, uh, to what extent is the feed part of the supply chain included in these deforestation in the deforestation figures? I'm not sure if that refers to JBS or if that refers generally. To yeah, I'm sorry, the... it's the JBS. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it does not. No. So, so again, I, it's a good point to uh, to raise that uh, when we talk about the actual footprint, our figures are conservative because it also does not include any indirect. Um, um, drivers of uh, uh, deforestation linked to the production of soy um, that's used for animal feed. Um, so that, and, and that in particular is relevant for, for the company's uh, uh, poultry and, and also its uh, pork operations. Um, we don't have the data, we've not included that in any of the figures we present today. Okay, great. Thanks, Tim. Next question is about a recent report that came out from um, HB, HSBC analysts. They um, criticized JBS for their lack of actions toward eradicating deforestation in its supply chain, yet it's still recommended that investors maintain the company in their portfolios. Yes, shall I answer that? Yep, uh, go ahead, Gerard. Thanks. Yes. Um, well, we have uh, listed in uh, the top 25 uh, uh, finances of this uh, of, of JBS, and HSBC does not belong to that list. But normally, with the uh, with the uh, mentioned uh, finances, and if they have some uh, some if we find some conflict with their uh, forest or deforestation policies, uh, we uh, we we try to get contact with these finances and uh, try to set up a call in order to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to discuss the outcomes of our report so yes uh, normally we do uh, we are engaging uh, on that level uh, with these companies and um, and uh, on a different level green century is setting up letters um, um, on specific actions to, uh, to, 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 to companies. And JBS has been already been often subject of such letters uh, by uh, the platform organized by Green Century. Great, thanks. Um, we have time for um, a couple last questions. Uh, could, the, so the UK is now having consultation on introducing legislation to limit the entry of deforestation linked commodities to the UK market. What type of signal would this send to um, companies in, like JBS in Brazil and how would it, it possibly impact them? Um, I think in terms of the signal, it's very clear that, that you know, this is uh, an additional restriction to export markets. Uh, and it, it, it really increases the risk that, you know, if you do not mitigate your indirect supply chain and you do not step up and, and, and really address this issue, uh, yeah, your access to the UK market may be, uh, may be jeopardized. Um, so I think it's in terms of the signaling uh, function, it's, uh, it's extremely powerful. Um, and, and it is something that, you know, is, 
yet another one of these developments in addition to uh, some that we have discussed already uh, that just seem to be mounting up um, uh, for the meat sector as a whole and, and JDS in particular. Hey, great, thanks. And our last question is, um, what more can the, the big three meat, meat packers do as an industry front to mitigate deforestation risk in their indirect supply chains? Well, I sorry. Um, well, I think there's there's various steps that that can be taken. As we met, well, we spoke already about possibilities to certainly improve the monitoring of the indirect supply chain as a high priority. To exclude suppliers that are um, not operating according to the required standards and. Um, yeah, it, it will require investment, certainly, but I think the examples of how researchers and, and you know, uh, yeah, researchers like, like us are able to identify risks and uh, deforestation in supply chains show that, yeah, that there are certainly possibilities to improve the situation considerably if there's enough will to do it. Great, thanks Barbara, and thanks to Tim and Harard. Um, so we're coming up on the hour. Um, if anyone has any more questions or wanna continue the conversation with us, please get in touch with us anytime. We really appreciate everybody tuning in and um, we'll talk to everybody soon. Thanks again.